Casting Reparo on a fractured index finger. Reparo! De'Aaron Fox rose to the occasion to lead his Kings in a hostile environment on the road to dominate Game 6 of the Western Conference quarterfinals in the Bay. Foxy Cleopatra was a whole lot of man. Oh, shit. My bad. Pause. <laughs> uh, oh, boy. Uh, just. <laughs> The future better get ready for me, because I'm Foxy Cleopatra, and I'm a whole lot of- Man. <laughs> Listen, Foxy, I just want you to know I never intended to hurt you, baby. The band-aid Malik Monk was dicing up defenders like the F1-type speedily shifting pure shock-creating phenom that he is, and a late red velvet arrival saw Kevin Herter get flowing just at the right time to help cement this one as a Game 6 heartbreaker for Dub Nation. The beneficiaries of a profusely well-managed Mike Brown offense, the coach of the year has provided a soothing touch of strict professionalism and high-energy easygoingness in terms of managing this King's locker room. In terms of between the lines, his Golden State-influenced DHO heavy playbook that he got from assistant coach in the defending champs for over half a decade has made Sacramento's system elusive and tough to game plan for. Fox was the team's on-court vibe enhancer, toughness bringer and spark plug. Conversely, the dubs were giving zero fox whatsoever, seemingly unengaged mentally and physically in this one, displaying an evident lack of poise. In what's become one of the most intriguing first round playoff series of all time, it's become staggeringly unpredictable to attempt to scope out which storyline we're in the midst of witnessing. Are we seeing yet another chapter in Stephen Curry, Klay Thompson, and Draymond Green's Golden State Dynasty? Or is the all-time trio's domination coming to an end, with the script conversely molding in the favor of the up-and-coming speed blurs from SAC? Whichever narrative you buy into, like the great J. Cole once said, love yours, as while we all want our favorite players to win, no matter which way the score goes, either side's perseverance ultimately can't help but be respected by the opposition. In Game 7, you can expect what we've been seeing from these games all throughout the series, beastly two-way back-and-forth tennis-like action, which shifts our perspective. With the Kings attempting to win their first playoff series as an organization all the way back since 2004, and the dubs looking to keep their dynasty alive not just this year but into the future, who will fold first is an impossible question to answer. For Golden State, the reason their dynasty is on the line for the future in addition to just this year is that unless you're Kawhi Leonard, a championship implies your top impending free agent would opt to stay, in this case for the Warriors, their defensive backbone in the Dennis Rodman-esque Draymond Green could foreseeably opt out of his contract if the Warriors get eliminated here, with rumors swirling around the all-time versatile defender teaming up with his fellow Clutch Sports member LeBron James in LA. How the Warrior players not merely say they feel about Draymond being here for the long term, but how they actually feel about Draymond being here for the long term will be exposed in Game 7, whether they want to believe that or not. For Draymond specifically, It'll also display how badly he wants to be in Golden State any longer. It's been time to forgive their valued enforcer for quite some time now, as hard as that is to believe. It's a lesson we aren't taught, but when we don't forgive someone for their actions, in most cases, that tends to make said person's actions worse. Of course, we shouldn't relentlessly forgive, but it's time when someone's shown improvements, or at least they're trying to show improvements. With the dubs as a 15-man unit, it feels like they haven't taken the time to properly forgive Draymond like the four-time champion and brother that he is. This has, in addition to many other things, continued to kill the team's chemistry. Stephen Curry's plus-minus had been exceptional leading up to Game 6, but this man was a minus 16 in this one. As the team's best player and top leader, he's got to do a much better job at bringing the right mantra or setting the tone for his group. De'Aaron Fox's early career legacy would look pretty damn good if, with a fractured hand, he was able to go 1-0 against Steph Curry in the playoffs. Right now, De'Aaron is nearly doubling Steph in assists per game in this six-game clash, with Game 7 looming on Sunday afternoon. The afternoon start heavily favors the young Sacramento Kings, who are not just younger, 
but not as committed to their routines as the veteran warriors, not to mention will have fresher legs than the aging dubs. With the horrendous effort, attention to detail, confidence, engagement, and focus that Kerr's group brought in Game 6 at home, seemingly intimidated by the poise of a group whose experience doesn't even compare to theirs, you can expect the young but intelligent Kings to, at the very, very least, keep Game 7 close. At most, meanwhile, this ideal for the modern day, array of silky smooth creators off the bounce in De'Aaron Fox and Malik Monk, paired with lengthy, versatile wings in Keegan Murray and Harrison Barnes, not to mention X-Factors who can defend their stations at an elite level in the perimeter clamping Davion Mitchell for the backcourt and the shot stifling paint protection of Ukrainian Alex Len in the frontcourt. Another overseas man in Lithuanian beast Demontis Sabonis is looking to prove to the hating talking heads that he's maybe the toughest presence to hold down offensively that the NBA has to offer. Despite getting elbowed, smacked in the grill, stomped on the chest, sat on, all while dealing with a heavily underreported all while dealing with a heavily underreported hand injury that he's been dealing with since late December, Sabonis is on the verge of being a massive factor in the elimination of the reigning defending champs. The Kings' toughness from start to finish, plus the fact that they were unintimidated by the Warriors, showed itself to be evident. After the Warriors were getting their own consisting of overhand rights and hooks to the stomach in Game 5 to steal home court, the Kings' poise, elusive yet confident body language, and enthusiasm was allowing them to lace home uppercuts to stop the Warriors in their tracks on the fly. To be fair to Coach Kerr, this man was preaching poise and discipline in his mic'd up interviews in the second half, but his odd Curry substitution patterns were revealed as unorganized when he took Curry out being down 12 midway through the fourth quarter, then Mike Brown called a timeout and Steph was sucked right back in. Either way, Kerr will continue to stick to his guns and Steph will continue to buy into the system. While the Warriors were harnessed mentally from a team perspective internally, let's be fair to them because the outside world wasn't giving them too much to bank on either. Given talking heads like Kendrick Perkins were attempting to jinx them, this was Perkins before this outing in Golden State. Like I said, I'm tapping out and it's Warriors, Bay Area, I'm riding with them. <laughs> Meanwhile, this was Perkins before this series. Absolutely, they end Steph season. <laughs> Unfortunately, not everyone picked up on this blatant flip-flopping, as you could hear over the broadcast the Dubs PA announcer repeating the patented Warriors chant and his Warriors Bay Area late in the first half. So that jinx from Perkins evidently succeeded. Then you had fans doing the prolonged warrior chant near the end of the game, as we may have to remove Perkins from ESPN respectfully for this clear jinxing of Dub Nation. But you have to give credit to Sacramento, matching a Dub's road win with one of their own. Nights like these display why they had the best road record in the West during the regular season. Now the Warriors face an improbable, nightmarish task, even by their dynasty standards, to somehow realize the moment come together as a group for the greater good on the road, and take down the mature yet feisty kings who aren't afraid to sacrifice the slightest bit of energy to get it done, and most importantly, who aren't afraid to steal the warrior's flow for themselves and run with it for good. You're taking everything I work for, motherfucker! Usually the warriors can get over a simple jinx like the one from Kendrick, but maybe it was a bit confusing when Nick Wright would attempt a reverse jinx Hold on a minute, buddy. The idea. Hold on, buddy. The idea that I wouldn't stick with my pick of the Sacramento Kings, even despite the fact that they're down three games to two, that's just a travesty. Hold on, brew. Brew. The idea. Guaranteeing in Charles Barkley fashion that the Kings would come back to win this series as he initially predicted. But it's time to give respect to a man in Malik Monk who hadn't received nearly enough flowers throughout this all-time first round series. Band-Aid Monk was one of the best six men across the association all year, and this guy was showing exactly why that was the case on Friday night. 
Foxy's fellow Kentucky flamethrower was creating shots off the dribble with quick twitch maneuvers, whether it was with his fast handle, his fast trigger, or his fast footwork to open up space between he and his defender and get anything he wanted for himself off the bounce, cultivating in this man ending with 28 points in the biggest game of his life. Monk would combine with the best student at Hogwarts in De'Aaron Fox, aka Malik's Kentucky Brethren, to outscore the Warriors by 41 when the Wildcat backcourt graced the court. With that said, one of the most impressive parts about this game, if you're a Kings fan, is the fact that your team held the Warriors to under 100 points, because we knew this Sacramento squad was an offensive powerhouse coming into the postseason, a team with a deep playbook who set the NBA all-time record for the highest offensive rating in a season, surpassing the Durant, Harden, and Irving-led 2021 Brooklyn Nets for that record. However, on the other side of the court, we didn't think they could lock down like they did in Game 6. The Warriors were held to just 99 points, the second lowest point total in a playoff game of theirs since 2019. Out of the 133 playoff games since the Warriors started their dynasty with the initial championship in 2015's playoff run, Game 6 of the 2023 Western Conference Quarter Finals was their 18th lowest scoring performance as a team in a playoff game by a Draymond, Curry, and Steph-led squad. Despite the Kings ranking all the way down at number 25 among 30 teams in defensive rating during the regular season, equating to the worst mark among all playoff squads, the Warriors were extremely bothered by Sacramento's man-to-man -man pressure, evidently. We talked about all the adversity the Dubs had faced last video throughout the years. The Kings have also been through hell and back, especially as of late. The adversity the Kings have faced consists of the narrative generally being against them, whether it's the storytelling of both the mainstream or the YouTube media, a potentially legitimate but nonetheless mysterious conspiracy, which we talked about in yesterday's video about De'Aaron Fox's injury, not to mention Fox and Sabonis both being hurt. Sabonis picking up five fouls midway through quarter number three and fouling out with five minutes left in the fourth wasn't the easiest to overcome either. Let's step on the court to figure out whether Sacramento's biggest buckets of the night were due to either their playbook, their individual creation, or their hustle. Last episode on this channel, we looked at the weaving blur of a finish from Steph, which KO'd the Kings in Game 5 in Conor McGregor-esque fashion. This bucket from last name ever, first name Vredis and De'Aaron Himothy Fox was nearly identical to that Curry dagger, where after getting the switch onto Looney, he attacks Kavon's lead foot with a crossover going downhill to his strong hand, goes behind the back, proceeds to swiftly change direction to skirt around Looney in Kyle Lowry-esque fashion before Euro-stepping past Wiggins to get back to his left for the what maneuver could possibly be smoother type of play. Draymond had his moments of clamping up Foxy in this one, but this play just ain't gonna cut it, as the speed and elusiveness from De'Aaron, this time exploding to his offhand, allows a momentum cross to get him the first step, and the downhill force he's gathered gains him enough elevation to embrace both Wiggins and Green for the dominant floater. The Red Velvet Cupcakes would then finally arrive at the table, as Kevin, don't call him Kavon Herter, would benefit off this effort-driven tap-out as Kevin would drift cut out to the left corner by finally knocking down his first field goal of the night. It's been a struggle for the former Atlanta Hawk pretty much for this entire series, so if Herter can get involved, that helped out the Kings' chances tremendously. 9.5 points per game from the product of Maryland, who will earn $17 million next season, maybe hasn't been criticized enough, but he came through last night. With that said, the fact that Sacramento's one win away from ending the having broken, twisted, bad boy warrior season and dynasty, and Herter hasn't come close to playing his best, that goes to show you the backcourt and shot creating depth of the Kings. Because while the dubs were missing easy ones at the charity stripe all night, finishing with 10 missed free throws, including 3 rare misses from Steph and 3 in a row from Andrew, Former Toronto Raptor Terrence Davis finally stepped up for a couple buckets, finishing with a crucial 7 points. Good to see TD3 come through on the biggest stage. Additionally, my fellow Canadian Trey Lyles. Hey Lyle.
Carlisle. Would set the on ball in this weak side for pop action and get a catch and shoot opportunity after a kick out from Fox before draining a clutch bomb, contradictingly in the face of my fellow Torontonian and Andrew Wiggins to put the Kings up by double digits early in the frame. In addition to his duly noted speed off the bounce, De'Aaron Fox's three-point ability makes him a spectacle for audience members and a nightmare for opponents. As to seal this one, even after the switch got him the tougher matchup onto Wiggs, a brilliant seal-off by Keegan Murray blocks off both Andrew and Jordan, allowing Fox to execute a hezzy bounce and off the dribble bomb. Beautiful action from Mike Brown's playbook on that possession. If that play didn't show you that Foxy's for real, then you definitely took that in the next time down when he followed up that off the dribble three pointer by curling off this full corner DHO action with a quick change of direction to attack Loon, who's far too low in drop coverage with the Warriors game plan to make Sabonis a shooter. Off the court, it's been a series that, as sports in general likes to do, has reminded us all about the importance of managing one's ego. On the court, it's been a series that's reminded us how important game-to-game -game coaching adjustments are, and additionally, how advanced both offenses are. Now the Warriors, who had the third worst road record in the West, face a Game 7 on the road with their backs completely against the wall, in a situation where they ranked 27 out of 30 in, in terms of their record during the regular season. After Steph told the Warriors faithful to show up early, Dubs fans were filing out of the building with over four minutes remaining in this Game 6 affair. But for Sacktown, the only thing on this fanbase's mind were some red velvety daggers. First, Herter would get a swing pass out of a five-man pick and roll action to make it a 13-point Kings lead. Then, he'd get the favorable switch for the night onto a man lacking lateral quickness on the perimeter in Kevon Looney and utilize a moving jab step plus step back to extend the Sacramento advantage to an insurmountable 16, maybe contributing to a shockingly abrupt end to the Warriors dynasty just when they had seemed invincible. What a thrilling, unpredictable ride that we've all been blessed to witness.